When Van Gogh was forced to leave his parents' home because he impregnated a young girl who modeled for him, he has less than five years to live. We saw that his style was a little more than copying others, and his taste was directly against what was going on in Paris. In November 1885, he moved to Antwerp. As one of the busiest port in Europe, there are plenty of bars, brothels, and syphilis. For Van Gogh, he survived on bread and coffee, with something like one hot meal a month, according to his letter to Theo. But in the same letter, he did not want Theo to tell their mother about it. Van Gogh worked frantically, spending the money on painting materials. Prostitutes slash models, tobacco and alcohol. At thirty-two, he has passed the age that his body could take this kind of abuse. To make a long story short, the mess forced him to take the entrance test for the Academy of Fine Art in Antwerp. He passed, but his style of piling paint. Onto canvases quickly made all the instructors ask him to go to the lowest level of drawing class to be properly trained. After he turned the Venus de Milo into a robust Flemish matron, according to a fellow student, he had a fight with the teacher. You can guess the rest. Throughout this mess, Van Gogh kept on painting. He studied hard. In Antwerp museums, especially Rubens, and lightened up his palette a bit, although nowhere near what was going on in Paris. He also spent his time studying color theory, a rough introduction of which is in episode ten, season one. Also important to his future development in the poor city of Antwerp, where all cultures converged, Van Gogh was impressed by the Japanese ukiyo-e woodcut print. We've discussed that in episode four, season one. After four riotous months in Antwerp, Van Gogh moved to Paris to live with Theo. In June, they moved to a bigger apartment in Montmartre, so Van Gogh could have more space working. He studied at the Fernand Courmon studio. Here is a painting by Courmon. In Courmon studio, he met Emile Bernard. And Henri de Toulouse Lautrec. Here is a pastel drawing by Lautrec of Van Gogh. They frequented the paint shop of Julian Tongi, who exchanged paint for paintings, and was exhibiting George Seurat and Paul Signac at that time. Van Gogh painted. The Moulin de la Galette, shown here. If you still remember the painting by Renard we showed in episode twelve, season one, you know what the inside looked like. Van Gogh's version looked at the place from some distance, not at all like Montmartre today, right? He also painted other places on Montmartre, portrait of friends, and still lives. He also painted scenes near River Seine, like this one, and the scenes along the way there from his apartment at Montmartre. In early 1887, he moved to Asnières to stay with Emile Bernard with his parents. It was at this time, after staying in Paris for a year without much change of his style, that he significantly lightened his canvases. Finally, he was getting on with the latest development. As his brush was fully loaded, we see that Van Gogh was strategically planning his brush strokes because, doing wet on wet, just like Monet, he did not have a chance to come back to do this again. This happened a year after he got to Paris. After picking up the trend in Paris, he was ready to get something going. In this painting, we see that he tried to use Monet's brushstroke techniques to do something else.
In episode 4, season 1, we show the painting by Van Gogh of the Japanese ukiyo-e. Here's Van Gogh's copy of Kaisai Aisan. In Japan, this is called Bijinga, or beauty pictures. By now, he had collected hundreds of these ukiyo-e prints. Unlike the one we showed before, he did not bother with the Japanese writings. In Anier, he met Paul Signac, who was 15 years younger, not even 25 years old then. Signac gave him what was known as pointillism. As seen here, it is a way of representing things with colored dots, like today's television, tablet, or cell phone screens. But the purposes are different. For the modern technology, the purpose is to make the dots so small that we can use a few pure colors to create a photographic effect. Van Gogh used pure colors to make his canvas shiny. He was putting the color theory he learned in Antwerp into practice. Also in this period, November 1887 to be exact, Van Gogh and Theo got to know Paul Gauguin. The event was important to Gauguin because Theo was a managing art dealer of a leading Parisian gallery. The event was important to Van Gogh because he integrated Gauguin's symbolism into his paintings. One thing worth mentioning in this period is that he started to paint sunflowers. As we've seen and shall continue to see, great artists are great because they can recognize great things. We saw Picasso copying Gauguin because he was impressed by his paintings and sculptures and then tried to deny the influence. Van Gogh in this period frequented a restaurant called Grand Bouillon, a restaurant with long tables and simple sit menu for low-income Parisians. As someone with no knowledge of market and marketing, Van Gogh talked the owner into letting him organize an exhibition there by hanging paintings of himself and others like Lutrec and Bernard on the walls. You don't need me to tell you whether these low-income Parisians open their pockets to buy these avant-garde paintings. One good thing that came out of this farce is that Gauguin came to visit and was impressed by Van Gogh's sunflowers. Van Gogh exchanged two of his sunflowers of one of Gauguin's paintings. This even kicked Van Gogh into high excitement. He created 11 sunflower paintings in all, four in Paris, seven in Arles. As everybody probably know, sunflowers are one of Van Gogh's signature subject matters. Always trying to bite off more than he could chew, Van Gogh was finally burnt out. Besides all other activities, in those two years in Paris, he painted more than 200 paintings and fundamentally updated his style to the modern age, placing himself at the front of the avant-garde. Now the only thing awaiting was to break new ground. We'll get into that part of the story in the next episode. I'll see you then.